Good morning, everyone. Try to shake you up a little bit here. Tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I started collecting artifacts in 1978 uh, with my grandparents' farm, or on my grandparents' farm. I inherited a small stone collection that they had found over the years. Uh, during the course of the years, uh, I got my father involved in it, and during uh, from 78 to 2002 when I lived in Illinois, my father and I uh, found nearly 10,000 complete artifacts, uh, stone artifacts mostly, although we did find three or four copper tools over that period of time. Uh, upon moving to Wisconsin in 2000, I started looking and searching for artifacts up here. And with the copper industry being what it is around the Great Lakes, it's, uh, it's really been exciting to get out and find this stuff. Um, I'm currently president of the Badger State Archaeological Society, which is an amateur group. Um, you can join for a nominal fee, and we have quarterly magazines that come out that are very educational. Um, served as vice president of the Central States Archaeological Society. I'm not an archaeologist, not a professional archaeologist, uh, but it's just been a love of mine for years. Uh, during the course of the last 10, 12 years, we found most of these artifacts in the northern Wisconsin area, southern Michigan area. Uh, they date, I think, from as early as 6500 BC, right on through um, the Oni Oneota period, which is maybe 1000, 1200 AD. Um, many of the pieces are distinguishable by certain types. Some are socketed ovates, some are socketed triangulates, some are tang knives. Um, we have pieces that have silver in them, which is, occurs naturally right in with the copper. Uh, recently, I found a cache of five tools. They're down uh, a little bit further down the aisle down there. But um, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience to find this stuff. And I've experimented with making the copper tools as well, using the Neubauer uh, system much like Larry Furrow, um, made a six inch rat tail spear. Now it took me about four and a half hours to do it, but I cheated. I used a torch to, uh, to heat the copper up to make it soft, again, soft and workable. And we used um, a hammer stone on a stone anvil. And it, um, it really gives you an appreciation for what these people did. Um, most of these pieces, like I say, were found in Wisconsin Michigan area. Um, it's just been, been a wonderful thing. There's uh, many other artifacts down here. If anybody has any questions or uh, comments, or whatever, I'll be around most of the weekend. I brought the display. I was asked to bring the display just to give folks uh, something to look at and what, what is typically found around here. Wasn't uh, going to speak at all, <clears throat> but somebody talked me into it. So. We're just going to make do with what we can here. Are there any questions at all about uh, what we have in front of you? Sure. You, you mentioned the date of 8,000 years on some of 6,500 BC, I think, was uh, the earliest carbon date that I've seen. Is that from some of these, or are you talking about other data? Other, other artifacts that were tested. Um, these were dated. Not yet. Um, they're trying to talk me into, which isn't taking much effort, but I've got. 10 or 12 pieces that have um, carbon datable material in them. And uh, hopefully when Robin gets things rolling, we can take those pieces and have them dated. Culturally speaking, um, at the one, the one frame down at the end on the top row, if you look closely, you'll see a snake effigy. Uh, that was found in northern Vilas County, and it's probably Oneota or Mississippian culture. I don't think it's old copper culture, per se. It's uh, fairly later. Some of the earlier points are very um, reminiscent of the Agate Basin point, which I've got several examples here made out of Hickston uh, silicified sandstone. Um, we have copper points that are mo made almost identical to those, and we're assuming um, that they are probably this, somewhere around the same date, which would be 6,500 to 7,000 BC. Yes? I heard that the Wisconsin River an important uh, transportation route for the dissemination of native copper. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. 
it's, it's very, very um, well known that that was a major highway. Uh, they were mining the copper, bringing it down to the Lake Butazer area and just following the river downstream. And there are significant sites all along the Wisconsin River, all the way down to uh, the Mississippi. Other highways, uh, the Fox River was used in the eastern part of the state. Uh, that was a very heavily traveled area. That's Wolf Prairie River, Fox Shane. River. Is it Prairie du Chien where the Wisconsin River system flows into the Mississippi? Uh, is it Prairie du Chien or La Crosse? I, I can't Prairie remember. Chien. Prairie du Chien, yeah. And there's lithic material in Prairie du Chien as well uh, that was heavily traded throughout the Midwest. So they were, they were transporting copper down and they were bringing flint materials up. Yes? There's a lot of these kinds of materials available that where um, the exact place they came from is not definable anymore because, you know... Where it was found, it just wasn't cataloged or... Or it wasn't, you know, it, it, it's all in how it was collected. And so, so from a geologic point of view, I have a different perspective on this mm -hmm. maybe, but uh, I like to think... I like to know exactly the location and then how it relates to layers of material. And I would like to be able to go to the spot where you found this harpoon or mm -hmm. whatever it is and put my finger at, right at the place where it came from. So one, one of the, that? yeah, one of the very important things that we try to do with our society is to stress the uh, catalog, cataloging of every piece that we find. Now, if you look at, you can pick up literally any piece in my display cases, any piece or multiple pieces, and I can go to my file and tell you exactly where and when it was found and by who, what it is. So that bit of the information is, is being saved. Um, archaeology is a strange thing. It's the study, study of prehistoric man by destruction because every time you take something out of the soil, whether it's a professional or an amateur, it's now gone. That information, if it's not recorded, it's lost. One, one more thing is that uh, are, are your materials grouped by site so that you know which were found with which other ones? Some are, but uh, I try to frame them according to type, not so much location. We find multiple types of uh, tools on most sites. You'll find uh, triangulates, you'll find harpoons, you'll find awls, and I try to put them together in, uh, by type. But that's why every piece is cataloged. Thank you. Yep. There are some frames up there that, like the cash, the cash finds I have, I kept those separated. So, sure. Do you find these near the surface, or do you have to dig down, or do you just go to a site and then dig down gradually? Uh, we use a metal detector, although I have two or three sites outside the Wausau area that. Uh, it's actually tilled farmland, so I'm eyeballing, looking for stone tools and swinging a detector at the same time. And I've found copper and stone tools laying right on top of the ground. Uh, some of the pieces, uh, I would say generally speaking, are at a depth of four to 10 inches deep, but I have dug pieces that were almost two feet deep. Um, most of the time we find what we call poundings or debitage from them working copper. So they were probably staying right there for quite a period, uh, returning to sites uh, season after season. And they lost stuff just like we lose stuff today. I don't know if you've got kids. Uh, my kids were always dragging my tools off and losing the darn things. But, uh, and they, I'm sure they had the same thing there. Um, there tend to, one, one thing I have seen, certain types of tools, tend to appear in the same general area um, together, if that makes any sense. It's like the butchering tools. 
We find knives and stuff on the sites, but more often than not, uh, the, the larger butchering tools, the crescent knives, things of that nature, are back off uh, the, the main site. And I think it was, you know, they just, when they were butchering an animal or a fish or something like that, they didn't want that in camp. So they were doing that, you know, back off the camp a little ways and then bring the food back to the camp, leaving their tools there. And that's probably why they got lost occasionally. Can you distinguish between the origin of the copper as in some with mines versus uh, I'm not a geologist, but I have heard that they can. Some, some mining, uh, I can't think of the names right now, but there are mines that have more of one type of mineral or chemical or whatever than some of the other mines. And they can be, the artifacts can be tested. It's, it's, it's pretty tough because it's been modified so much. If you were to analyze the copper itself and compare it to known sources, from some of the mines up here, I'm sure somebody with more brains than me can probably do it. Trace elements. Trace in elements. A copper artifact found any place in the world can be fingerprinted to the mine where it came from. But throughout a whole mine, it can change. Yes, it can. That's true. So, so that sometimes they tell you it came from Isle Royal, certain mine. At a certain level, level A, B, C, D. Any other questions? Sure. I think that we saw a made of silver in some of the pieces. Yeah, there's there's silver that appears in several of the pieces, the smaller pieces, and one of the larger pieces I have in this big case on the on the floor here is probably ninety percent, ninety five percent entirely out of silver. It weighs one point three pounds, something like that. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it doesn't deteriorate like the copper does. So when it's been laying out there for thousands of years, the surface of the copper deteriorates, and it's almost like the silver is being raised to the surface, but that's the actual surface of the piece when it was first made. Rob? I was wondering about the, the stone tools. Do you find stone tools with the copper, like on the thin side? Or you yes. The yep. Of it? Yep, we do. Are those the ones up there? There, no, these were all surface found on sites, mostly in Illinois and southern Wisconsin. Um, side notch points, mostly up here, or side notch points uh, late paleo agate basins. Okay. I've got a agate basin and a Browns Valley point that came from the site. Um, I can't remember which one. It's all this in here. If you look at this frame here. That's all off of one field uh, just outside of Wausau. And there's, that's the site where I'm, I'm looking in the plowed soil and uh, swinging a detector at the same time. But there's a Brown Valley point out of uh, rhyolite and an agate basin point out of Hickston Slicified Sandstone. One more question. You mentioned that something about butchering and you would find certain tools there. It would be my impression that it would be very difficult to put a sharp edge on copper implements. But the flint ones, you can make, have them almost razor sharp. You can get uh, flint tools very, very sharp. And there's evidence of a couple of these pieces where they've been resharpened. You can see the beveling on the stone itself. The thing about the copper is uh, you can get a pretty fine cutting edge. I've got a couple of knives up there that. Uh, you could, you could easily butcher something with those. They're still very sharp. And you look at the, the green artifacts, you gotta remember that uh, much of the surface has eroded away. Uh, the copper knives that I found in the water are sharp as a razor. They, they never deteriorated. And I'm more than happy to take anything out if you guys wanna take a look at anything. Don? I just wanna mention, uh, copper is hard considerably after it's annealed, and then they can put an edge and keep an edge on it. You know, the last, last bit of the process that we've learned, um, when you're working the copper, you kinda, you've got to constantly 
heat it back up, to draw it back, to stress relieve it so it doesn't become hardened and brittle. But one of the last two things you do to the tool when it's nearing completion is you hammer the cutting edge and then you do not heat it up after that to make it soft. You pound, pound that out and then grind it to a keen edge. So your cutting edge will be a lot harder than say the tang or the socket of the point. Right. Uh, in finding the sites, I guess I, I got a lot of experience um, stone hunting in Illinois. And the Native Americans needed three basic things like we all do today. You need a good food supply, a good water supply, and shelter. Well, if you have a good water supply, there's going to be food there, whether it's mussels, fish, um, ducks, anything like that. So you're looking for a good shelter. Uh, like a exposed hill that's somewhat shielded from a larger hill or something like that. Um, normally we find a site on a shoreline or something close to where like two rivers come together, uh, a point that's exposed out into a lake. They didn't like bugs anymore than we did and they liked safety as well. If you can imagine a lake with a large peninsula on it or a point, it was a good natural um, area to to camp on. You had breezes across the lake to keep the bugs down. Uh, it was defendable and you could see, see all, almost all the way around. So those are the places I key in on what I look for and try to find the sites and typically um, that's been productive. Things about the copper itself, um, not everybody was an expert tool maker just like today. Some carpenters are better than others. When you see some of these pieces, they're actually just works of art and how they manipulated the copper to their benefit is just incredible. Um, they use some of the same techniques on the copper as far as hafting that they did on lithic materials. Uh, notched points, we have notched copper points. The earlier points, uh, we were talking about it last night, the more lancelot shaped copper points um, tend to be ground on the bases just like the agate basin points that are made out of flint. So that's kind of an interesting thing. They did that to protect the haftings. Um, just, they didn't like to have to rehaft things constantly either. One of the other things that I've learned, um, they didn't throw anything away. I mean, it was very, very valuable. I've got reworked tools or reprocessed tools where they appear to have been a large knife or large spear point. Uh, the blade either broke off or just got wore down to the point where it wasn't good for that particular use, they, re they reused it for something else. They would make a pendant out of it, they'd hammer it back out, make a smaller knife and all. They were constantly reusing the material as much as they could. Answer your question? Absolutely. Excellent. Anybody else? Did you find <clears throat> any sites where you thought there may have been battles because of damage? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I I found tools that were that showed damage, but I don't know if it was so much of a, of a battle. I've got points that are actually uh, I don't know if I have one in my case here this morning, but there's a conical point that I've got that is basically the end of it's bent, and the tip is flattened. It's like they threw that thing at something and um, missed and hit a rock or hit something hard, and they just dubbed it right over. So it could be just for hunting. Could be hunting, yeah. Or fishing. Hunting, fishing. Uh, a lot of the part, pieces that I have here, if you look at them, they look like they're almost brand new. Those were found in uh, water uh, sources. The copper was kept away from the oxygen, so it didn't oxidize like the green stuff from soil. We tend to find like conicals, spear points, socketed spear points. When we find those in the water, Normally they all have wood in them. They have a lot of wood material and that's why we're hoping to do some of the carbon dating on some of my pieces. Yep. Did you find any other evidence of human inhabitation other than copper and flint? 
um, uh, petroglyph um, in northern Wisconsin. There's piles of rocks. They call them, I can't remember what they call them, but I assume they're put there by Native Americans, but you can't really tell. Anything else? Yes? Just one of my thought processes, a lot of these things maybe weren't lost by a child, but they're lost with a dead kill. You got spirit of deer, it ran away, you never got it, and maybe the deer went to water for its sake. Right. And that does occur. I mean, we tend to concentrate on sites, you know, key areas of habitation, but I've hunted and hunted and hunted, and I've walked for miles and hours and found one piece, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. You know, something ran off, or we call them drops. They could have lost it while they were traveling from one place to another, but there's no other evidence. I mean, because when we, we find a piece, we stop, and we just systematically row the area out in several different directions, and um, in those cases, you find one piece, and that's it. So it's either, either a lost uh, tool through travel, or it got stuck in something and ran off. These were deadly weapons, too. They were using mostly... The atlatl, um, some th hand thrown spears, but most of these uh, right in the archaic time when they were using the atlatl. I don't know if anybody knows what those are, but it's basically the atlatl is an Aztec word for spear thrower. And it's a, about a foot and a half, two foot long extension of your arm with a spur on the end of it. And you'd socket your spear into that spur. And with a throwing motion like this, you could project that dart, uh, we call them darts, probably 15 times faster than a hand thrown spear. Uh, it's just a deadly weapon, and if you can imagine a spear traveling that fast, hitting like a shoulder bone or something like that with a conical uh, copper tip spear, it, it radially, ra radius, radiously or radially fractures that bone. It just destroys the bone, and it just, it's a, just a devastating injury to a deer or moose or whatever they were hunting, or for preservation purposes, maybe a, a human if they had to. Um, the, the flat points without the sockets or without the conical tips um, would be more of a cutting uh, weapon. It would slide into a bone, not necessarily shatter it, but just cut it. Yes? Right. And they were here, you know, for such a long period of time, and, and to understand how they used the land and how they respected it, and the animals, and just took what they needed, you know, to survive. And um, basically, if you don't go on to those sites, you wouldn't find it, like you say, because right. it's, it's, they're sporadic. But just to learn from them and, and what they did and how they were able to utilize the oh. resources is is like a geniusness that we don't. It's lost, and if you, yeah, and there's a TV show that I got hooked on watching, I think it's called The Last Survivor or whatever, and they turn like 10 people loose in different areas, um, and whoever manages to survive and stay out there the longest wins a half million dollars, whatever, those people really got to see what it was really like, and even then they had modern equipment with them, they had a tarp and this, that, and the other thing, but yeah, if you had to go out and sustain yourself for any period of time with just stone tools, not knowing where, where to go and how to look for stuff, it, it, would, be, it would be very, very difficult. Clothing. Clothing. Yeah, right. And brain, brain tanning is something that just amazes me. Uh, tanning of hides. Every animal has enough brain to create the chemical needed to tan its own hide. Whoever thought of that? <laughs> you know, who's going to take the brains out of an animal and then mix ash with it and make a soup and then rub it into a hide? How did they discover that? It just amazes me. But that's how they produced a lot of their uh, leather clothing. I think you have to remember that these things aren't created by evolution. There's a context. Thousands of years ago, 
changed the humans evolved just over time. Right. And so it's not like suddenly someone's being thrown out. Just thrown out by themselves. Yeah. Okay. They're, they have a history and a culture that yep. used to, to support their lifestyle. Yeah, we find find so much of the stuff too, but you gotta realize as well that you know, they were camping on some of these sites for generations. You know, you find copper tools there, but there's there were many, many other tools that we're not seeing. The stone, you know, metal detector won't pick that up. Uh, bone, of course, born, bone tools, wood tools, all deteriorated and uh, just, are, just are gone now, so. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, yep. I just got a comment and, and maybe uh, you can address it. Uh, there's, I have two, two great uh, uh, passions in archeology, span one being with, with yours, uh, is the copper, and the other one being uh, the uh, Paleo-Indian period here in the Western Great Lakes, both in Wisconsin in particular and here, here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, with those two interests, uh, I've always been intrigued as to whether or not uh, Paleo-Indian peoples uh, made use of copper, okay? And I do uh, agree that a lot of the, pro pro some of the projectile points that you do see do have, there's some that come up with, that do look like agate base, do look, at least in shape, that they, that they do resemble uh, at least point forms for mm -hmm. people. One of the things I've had an opportunity to do through the years is to work on uh, a great many paleo Indian sites uh, uh, here in the Upper Peninsula, particularly in Marquette County, and I'm going to be speaking on that tomorrow. And, uh, and so I'm always on the lookout when we work on these sites for any indication that the people that are living there, just when I'm talking about agate based and Elgap, Scotts Bluff, primarily whether or not uh, there was any uh, use of copper uh, that's uh, <laughs> evident on any of those sites. Uh, what I will say is there are two sites that, uh, uh, that we did uh, work on that we think are single component uh, 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 Pale Indian sites that did produce pieces of copper. And in both cases, it wasn't a, a, a nice finished artifact per se, like you see up there, but in both cases, it was almost identical uh, flat hammered pieces of work copper that just looked like a flat ingot, if you will, and that was it. I've always wondered about the, uh, uh, whether or not, uh, the, say for example, the agate base and getting back to that particular shape, and I know you mentioned that. Uh, I, I, I've, looked at some, I've looked at the literature and some of the articles that have been written, some of the evidence that was presented by people who think that perhaps it could be paleo Indian based upon the shapes. And, uh, and, uh, and I was all in favor of that, but a few years ago, uh, I witnessed uh, a, a, a collector retrieve a perfect, a beautiful uh, agate basin shaped copper spear point, but it was from a single component, a definite single component Lake Woodland site. And that made me really stop and could reconsider whether or not the agate age. basin shaped uh, copper points are in fact Lake Paleo. But again, I seen this, I saw retrieve from a single yeah. component Lake Woodland site. So yeah. It really makes me wonder again, and I'm not saying that Paleo Indians didn't, because I'm sure that at some point uh, somebody picked up copper and tried to do something with it. Uh, but I just wonder about whether the technology was, was there, uh, say, 10, 11, 12,000 years ago to produce something as fine as what we see. Yeah, and, and so it's just, it's just sort of a question. So when you brought it up, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's, it's speculation. I mean, yeah. we're, we're just hypothesizing you know, that they are because of uh, the look. Yeah. But until it's uh, come, until it's actually excavated with carbon datable material from a single component site, yeah. you know, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be speculation. Yeah. Um, that's why we wanna do all this carbon dating as much as we can right. to, to get a better picture. Um, but I agree wholeheartedly. Um, sure. We gotta cut it down. Okay, fine, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.